Uh, after my video on uh, narrative dissonance, I was asked to kind of continue that series, I guess, and talk about more uh, storytelling elements and structures and things like that. And the thing that got brought up um, both times I was asked about this was the hero's journey. Um, and then another was act structure. And well, I thought I could do a quick video, maybe knocking both of those out. So uh, we're going to start with the hero's journey, which looks a little bit like this. Um, this was uh, a theory of storytelling introduced by uh, Joseph Campbell in, I think it was 1949, in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And what the book is about, um, and what his research was, was about something called the monomyth, which is uh, he read all of these myths and stories from all over the world from years and years and centuries ago. And he discovered that a lot of these stories, if not all of them, um, especially about heroic figures, savior figures, share um, a lot of plot elements. And uh, these plot elements uh, are the beginning, of course, uh, the call to action or the call to adventure, uh, which is something happening that kind of starts the journey, tells the hero, hey, there's this thing that you can do. There's usually a refusal to the call, which is the hero saying, nah, I don't want to. Um, the hero then gets some aid of some sort, uh, some supernatural aid, uh, which kind of pushes him over this barrier from the known into the unknown. Um, although this, in a lot of other stories, instead of being known and unknown, uh, could be comfortable to uncomfortable. Pushes the character out from a place of comfort, a place where he knows, a place you know that, that is familiar to him or her, into a place unfamiliar to him, to the unknown, to the uncomfortable. Um, then there, once, or maybe right before he gets pushed over, um, or right after, there is a mentor figure, usually, um, some old master that has a bunch of knowledge that he then teaches our hero. They go through some tests. Uh, these are like tests of like strength, courage, wisdom, uh, think the uh, trials of Hercules, that sort of thing. Tests to prove the hero's ability in the unknown. There's usually uh, a true love, um, although it might not always be love. It's just the hero tr finds something that really motivates them more than... Uh, like saving the world or whatever, it's something personal, something that makes his journey a, uh, a personal growth experience. There's then a uh, part where he is tempted by something, either tempted to go back to his home where he is comfortable, leave the world as it is, he's tempted to um, join the dark side, so to speak. There's something that tempts him uh, away from his journey, tries to get him off the straight and narrow. Um, after confronting that temptation, there's a confrontation with the evil. This confrontation usually uh, is either the first victory after the test, like the first big victory, uh, but more than often also results in a symbolic or literal death and rebirth. Um, either he loses here causing the death, or sometime between his victory he gets overconfident or something, and he ends up losing really badly. This is the hero at his lowest point, where he has to come back and he transforms himself. He realizes something about himself, he gets a new power, something happens to this hero that then allows him to achieve final victory over the threat, um, also called atonement, if it's a more personal story, he learns something, he conquers whatever needed to be conquering, whether that's a villain, whether it's himself, whatever. And then there's the trip back to normalcy, back over that threshold, um, where the hero then imparts their wisdom or shares what they have learned over their journey to the rest of the world. And that is the hero's journey. Um, and if you read books on storytelling, if you read uh, uh, like books on how to write a screenplay, how to write a story, you'll probably encounter this. Um, and what I see in a lot of these books, uh, especially in screenwriting, because that's what I'm kind of teaching myself how to do, but also in, um, uh, I mean, like I said, I do have, a, 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 I'm mainly a critical and analytical background here. This is an, a tool for analysis of storytelling. This is not a how-to guide to how to tell a good story. It's not a, um, you know, like a, a map, a, a flowchart to writing a good story that will be beloved and known forever. This is something that Joseph Campbell, through his research, put onto all of these stories and noticed that it fit really well. Um, the, pers the people who wrote the Bible, uh, the Buddha, um, the, the people who wrote King Arthur, uh, like Shakespeare, every great writer who this circle applies to 
did not have this to consult when telling their stories. They had previous work, so of course people like the, the people who wrote King Arthur and stuff consulted stuff like the Bible when writing their own stories, but they didn't have this all laid out in front of them. This, you can use this as a template if you want to. You can begin, okay, I have a hero, and he's going to go through all these steps, and you could do that, and that's fine if you want to write that story. But this is not a how-to on how to write a good story from beginning to end. This is just a sample plot structure that a lot of popular stories have used. Now, saying that, after saying that, uh, I want to get you now into act structure. Um, and so usually you'll have uh, three-act movies. I mean, that with, in popular culture, we are most familiar with three-act structure. Um, but before getting into the whole diagram I grew up of the three-act structure, I want to uh, ask and then answer what an act is. And this can be a little challenging, um, especially if you only know about the three-act structure, because you're thinking, well, the three-act structure, beginning, middle, and end, and that's not what the act is. The acts aren't the beginning, middle, and the end. Um, what defines an act, usually, is a point of no return. An act ends once the story reaches a point where the main characters can no longer backtrack. They can no longer go back on their decisions. Um, or if it's not their decisions, if it's not something they decided, the world has changed around them in some way that makes it impossible for them to go back along their journey. It's something it pushes them forward. So um, normally applying the three-act structure to the hero's journey would look something like this. And this is your typical three-act structure in a movie. So the first act usually takes us from the beginning of the movie to the hero crossing the threshold. It's the hero deciding or being pushed into the unfamiliar world. And once that happens, once the story kind of begins in earnest, that is the typically the end of the narrative first act of the movie, and this takes around 30 minutes, typically. Um, it could take... Well, I'll get into other examples uh, after this. But typically, if you're, doing, if you're using 3-act structure, this typically takes around 30 minutes. That's what you're told in the screenwriting books and all of that. Like your first act should be 30 minutes and end with the hero being pushed forward past that first point of no return. The second act then covers everything from him crossing the threshold all the way, usually all the way to his transformation. So that is the Iron Man, let's say, which uses something different, I think. But if you were to put this on like Iron Man, uh, the three act structure, act two would be everything from the creation of the Iron Man suit, like him flying back to America, to the point where... Um, like just the beginning of the big battle with the Ironmonger, and that's all Act Two, and that takes around 60 minutes in a two-hour movie. Um, so that's around half your movie is just Act Two, and then the rest of the movie, Act Three, is after that transformation, after the hero learns everything they're supposed to learn, that final confrontation with the enemy, their final big push, um, and the third act is that point all the way to the end of the movie, and that's usually another half hour. And a problem with the three act structure I find is that the second act is too long and not focused enough. The climax, and I point it out here, the climax of the second act, the point of the greatest tension in the second act, is usually the death of the character over here, which comes most of the way through. That means you have like 40 minutes here where you're just kind of building tension where things can start to drag. And if you have a movie that's kind of bad, that drags in the middle, it's the second act, usually. Um, it's that it's... Uh, I'm going to get to a way to maybe fix this uh, through, you know, just what I've analyzed and uh, stuff. But that's kind of my problem with three-act structures, that you, you're covering so much in Act 2, and just as much in Act 3. Like, Act 2 and Act 3 are around the same amount of things covered, but you're giving Act 2 a lot more space to do it, which means that it's usually dragged out where Act 3 is big and exciting and, you know, that's the final battle. You know, that's what every that's what everything's leading up to. And that's squeezed into half an hour. Usually the battle's like 20 minutes and you have 10-minute epilogue sort of thing. But then you have half the movie where you're just waiting for things to happen. You're waiting for things to escalate, for things to build, which is not always the most exciting part. 
Now, a way to fix this, and a way to fix many stories is, of course, by going back to the greatest writer who ever lived, Shakespeare. And if you look at Shakespeare, who didn't use the hero's journey all too much because he wrote mostly tragedies and the hero's journey is mostly uh, for kind of comedies. Like the, the Shakespeare wrote comedies too, of course, but his most famous plays, Macbeth, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, stuff like that are usually tragedies and the heroic, the hero's journey is kind of a comedic thing. And we'll get into comedy and tragedy in a different video. It's not just ha-ha and crying. But um, Shakespeare used the five-act structure, which I've illustrated here for your typical movie, and I didn't put the times in because that gets a, a lot more complicated depending on the story you're trying to tell. But as you can see already, the five-act structure is a lot more balanced. So you have the start, and the first act's still the same, start to threshold. But in a movie where you're using five acts, that could be 16 minutes instead of 30. You can pretty much have that. Right? And then you have act two, which is a lot, noticeably a lot shorter. Right? And with Act 2, you have the climax right in the middle. You have the tests, the hero's test, and that could be the climax. That could be the high point of Act 2. That's what you're putting your focus on. And then you have a bit of relief afterwards where you can breathe. You can say, okay, that happened. There was a victory. You know, we're cool now. And Act 2 usually ends with the hero facing temptation and deciding no. So we have the tests proving, okay, he's, the hero is capable. And then the temptation seeing not only is he capable, his heart is in it. He's pure in a way, you know? Act 3, then, is the low point of the movie. Act 3, the middle of Act 3, the character dies, or goes through a symbolic death. The character faces their greatest challenge and fails. You know, and that's exciting, because we're building up to that point of death. You can see it coming. You say, oh, the hero's cocky, he's overconfident, he's not prepared enough, the, the villain's that much stronger, something, whatever. And all through Act 3, you're building to that point of the character dying, having to learn something. And then Act 3 ends with the rebirth, symbolically or literally, and then the transformation. Then the movie starts to look more familiar. Act 4 is the transformation up to the final battle and the end of the final battle. It's transformation up to the character deciding to return to the rest of the world, to bring back what he learned, to transform the world as he has been transformed himself. And of course, in the middle of that, the climax of that is the big climax of the whole movie. It's the battle. It's good versus evil, final time, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. And then Act 5 is kind of the epilogue. Act 5, you have the hero who has conquered his enemy, returning and saying, this is, uh, you know, I have proved myself, I have you know, proved to myself and to the world I'm a hero, and I'm here to impart the knowledge I've gained, I impart the wisdom, the power, and share that with the rest of the world. And so, just again, comparing 3-act and 5-act, you can see 5-act structure a lot more balanced. You can have a movie with kind of a climax, a mini-climax in each act, you're telling kind of a full story, a vignette of sorts in each act that allows the story to kind of move smoother and just better, in my opinion. And uh, besides my opinion, I tried uh, putting the five-act structure onto uh, some movies. I'm just using uh, a few examples here, not just movies, but a few examples of stories that have used five-act structure, and I've colored it uh, to make it very fun looking. Um, so we're starting with Moses, um, classic, I think, example, like besides Jesus, probably the classic example of the hero's journey split into five acts. So Moses, act one, we have it, you know, Moses speaks to God, burning bush, all that. And act one ends when Moses decides to go to Egypt, to go to Egypt to free the slaves. That is the end of act one. That's him making the choice to go. Point of no return, he can't turn back and forget that he ever met God and all that. Act 2, Moses talks to the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh says no. Um, Moses is kind of defeated, you know, and he's thinking maybe maybe I can't do this, maybe I'm not ready. And Act 2 ends with Moses finding the wrath of God. He gets God's staff, and that would be Act 2 of kind of the Exodus story. Moses finding the staff, finding the anger, and deciding, okay, if Pharaoh is not going to let the Jews go, we're gonna we're gonna get do we're gonna have to do the ten plagues. Act three, you have the ten plagues. You have the the most exciting bit kind of of the Exodus thing everyone remembers. But then the you know even after the ten plagues, Pharaoh the villain still says no. Moses has done everything he could at that point. He's thrown the full wrath of God at Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says no, not freeing the Hebrews. So end of Act three, 
Moses takes the Hebrews. He's like, okay, we're getting out of here. Everyone come follow me. We're leaving Egypt. And so Moses leaves the Jews out of Egypt. He's become, he's transformed into that savior character, leading the Jews out of Egypt. Act four, Pharaoh gives chase. And we have the other big climax of the Exodus, which is the crossing of the Red Sea. The Red Sea parts and Moses leads the Jews across it. You know, again, no turning back. You can't cross the Red Sea again because it caves in, drowns Pharaoh and his army. And then Act 5, Moses goes up to the mountain and he brings the wisdom of God to his people, which if you then read the rest of the Old Testament doesn't go all too well for him because of golden calves and all that. But Moses still does it. He goes up Mount Sinai, he gets the commandments, he goes down. End of the story. Well, that part of the story, that chunk of Exodus. Moses has freed the slaves. Another example that doesn't work quite as well with the hero's journey, but works as a five-act structure because it was written in five acts, is Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. For, and this is kind of repetitive because it's a lot more complicated than I can really summarize in these little boxes here. But Act 1, you have the couple meet. Uh, Romeo is uh, pretty sure he's getting ready to marry someone else. Juliet's in waiting for in Paris. I haven't read the play in a while. But each of them are getting ready to marry someone else. They meet each other at the dance, and they decide, nah. They meet. That The couple meet, point of no return, end of Act 1. Act 2, Romeo goes over, you know, Romeo, uh, Romeo, oh, Romeo, Juliet is the East, blah, 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 Juliet is the Sun, whatever. And you have the couple falling in love. They decide, okay, we're going to get married. End of Act 2. Act 3, the parents are like, no, you can't marry him. He's a Capulet. He's a Matthew. Whatever. And so they decide, end of Act 3, to elope. They decide to run away, cast off their family names, whatever. They come up with the plan through Act 4, where Juliet takes the fake poison, allowing her to be moved to the, uh, the, the family tomb, where Romeo follows. And so Act 4 ends with Juliet taking the fake poison. Juliet fakes her suicide, right? And again, this doesn't quite line up with uh, the hero's journey because it's a tragedy, but uh, you can do here, um, meeting is them crossing the threshold, fall, you know, finding each other, falling in love. The, the wedding is against the temptation of um, their other suitors. They decide, okay, no, we're gonna get married. Act 3 is the death, you know, they can't get married, they decide, okay, we're going to transform, we're going to give up our family names, they elope. Act 4, they finally come up with the decision, they know how to beat their parents, how to escape. And then Act 5, you have Romeo finally crossing that threshold back into Juliet, um, and then they both die, because it's, again, that's not really a hero's journey story, but it's five acts. Um, so I wanted to illustrate that. Um, and now moving on to Star Wars, which is the kind of popular text to do with with both three-act structure and um, and the hero's journey, but I think is much better illustrated using uh, five acts, um, and actually is, movie, like, screenplays aren't typically written in act form, but it's actually split, I think, into five acts. Both Luke's story and Anakin's, so I did one for both. With Luke, act one is just the first movie. And this is the, the original trilogy. Act 1, just the first movie. He leaves Tatooine and he joins the Rebellion, right? So that's him crossing over into unfamiliar territory, crossing the threshold. Act 2 is kind of all of, um, or not all, but most of um, uh, uh, the, the Empire Strikes Back. He's training on Dagobah, those are his tests. And then through the movie, near the end, he goes to Cloud City. Um, and he's tempted by Vader. Vader's like, join me, blah, blah, blah. And that's, yeah, that, that, that is a dinner table. And then later, when they duel. And the duel is the beginning of the third act. So Empire kind of splits down the middle here between acts one and two. It's the Vader duel. Luke loses his hand. His, you know, Han is captured. Everything's in the shit at act three. That is the symbolic death of the story. Um, Luke loses his hand. Luke's defeated by Vader. But he makes a transformation between kind of episode 5 and episode 6. He's going to become a Jedi. He's going to finish his training, become a Jedi, rescue Han, all of that stuff. So Act 4 begins with um, with uh, Return of the Jedi. With Luke, uh, let me read here. With Luke 
saving Han, beating Vader. He's hyper confident. He beats Vader, and then the Emperor dies. Evil is defeated. And then Act Five, of course, you have the party. You have him. The Death Star's exploded. The Empire's fallen, and Luke decides he's going to rebuild. He's going to form the New Republic. So that's that's the entire Star Wars original trilogy in five acts from Luke's point of view. We can also do it from Anakin, which is again worse movies overall because half of them are the prequels. But he also follows a similar five act structure with his story. We have Anakin. Again, kind of the first, episode one, Phantom Menace, is Anakin's first act. He becomes a Jedi. He joins the Jedi Order. He leaves Tatooine, becomes a Jedi. Act two, his temptation. And uh, again, this is a tragedy, so it doesn't quite fit in the hero's journey, because he kind of gives into his temptation. He falls in with Padme, he falls in love with Padme, and he joins the dark side. He's tempted by Palpatine. Act three is the end of episode three. He dies, and he is reborn as Darth Vader. Kind of simple. Then we have Act 4, which is pretty much the same Act 4 as Luke Skywalker's. Which is, he's been defeated multiple times by his son, and he realizes, oh, this is my son. He finds the light side within him, and he decides to overthrow the Emperor. And then Act 5, same thing, he has overthrown the Emperor, he has helped bring down the dark side. He has that talk with Luke, where he says... You know, basically, I'm sorry. I've, I've tried to redeem myself. I hope I've done it. And then, at the end, he rejoins the Force, where he was conceived by. So he he kind of goes back into the womb, which is, like, the most comfortable space you can get in, like, certain psychological Freudian interpretations of things. So, um, that's pretty much that. Um, again, a lot of this is me coming from it from a, a more critical point of view instead of a storytelling point of view. This is me kind of breaking down these things instead of saying these are the best way to write a story. Of course, if you find a better way that your story is told, if your story is better told in two acts or six acts, if it follows the hero's journey entirely or if it deviates and tells something completely new, there are no concrete rules of storytelling um like the most concrete i'd say is cause and effect but even then if you really know how to do it if you've played around with your characters and your story enough and you're competent enough you can even do things without cause and effect you can go full absurdism full surrealism until still good, until and still tell a good story but these things the hero's journey act structure they're important foundational things these are things that have been used since the beginning of storytelling, since humans first told stories, since Gilgamesh, since the Greeks, since the Bible. These are kind of the, and of course that's just Western tradition, but they're similar. It's structural, you know? So you can build a house in colonial style or in like an ancient uh, Chinese style, it's still a house. The house is a house, it needs a foundation, and that's what these things are. They're foundations. They are base structures that we have used for millennia to tell stories, to teach lessons, to entertain, to inform. And so um, I hope you learned something about them that maybe you haven't considered. Um, if you have considered these, if you want to disagree and debate, I'm totally open to that. Um, but again, as I said, there's no right way to tell a story. Um, but this stuff has worked in the past for a lot of people. These are things that if you are writing a story, you maybe should consider, um, especially when it does come to act breaks, because those are important. Those determine the pacing of your story is, what is the point of no return? Where am I building tension in the story and where is it being relieved? So um, yeah, I, I do hope that uh, comes, you know, that, that's useful for you. If you're writing a story, if you want to learn how to analyze and criticize stories better, I, uh, yeah. There you go with a brief, not entirely brief, explanation of that thing. And um, next week, I think I'm going to continue doing this thing because, you know, got to put that education to use somehow. And um, I think next week we'll tackle the differences between comedy and tragedy and uh, then delve into protagonist and antagonist, kind of more really basic storytelling things that um, are kind of counterintuitively complicated because they're the simplest things. Um, that also lead to the most things, you know, with that, like, they're the most foundational. So, um, 
Today we tackled act structure and kind of a basic plot. And uh, next week, again, uh, tragedy, comedy, antagonists, and protagonists. So thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me for that one.